Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Lisa, I'm an ethologist. I wanna introduce you to a new series called Behaviour Bites. In this series, I'm gonna introduce you to key concepts in animal behaviour in digestible chunks. Lions roaring in the morning sun Searching for a longer day I'll be moving quite quickly through some of the concepts, but I'll be sure to highlight key names or terms so you can go and do some further research if you wish. So where better place to start than the history of animal behavior? Humans have been interested in the behavior of animals since the beginning of recorded history. Last year, archeologists believe they discovered the world's oldest artwork deep in a limestone cave in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. They date it at 45,500 years ago. And what was the artwork? A picture of three bush pigs. Humans have probably always been key observers of animal behavior, but more due to necessity, right? They, their survival depends on being able to eat, um, being able to hunt, and what better way to do that than starting to understand the behavior of your prey? Paintings of mammals, fish, and birds decorate the royal tombs from ancient Egypt some 5,000 years ago. Some early animal observers were surprisingly accurate. Modern studies have confirmed many of the observations of Aristotle from the fourth century, including the active camouflage of the octopus, how the nightingale learns its song, and that elephants use their trunk as snorkels while swimming through water. In the 19th century, descriptions of animal behavior tended to be very anecdotal and anthropomorphic. So putting human emotions, attributing them to animals. So we have the proud lion and the wise owl and the sly fox. During this time, there was a very designed by God view of species that they were perfectly or imperfectly designed and that's how they remained forever. Charles Darwin's work and the book, The Origin of the Species, published in 1859, was an exception to this. He found there was a relationship between the environment and the reproduction of populations. So a competition almost over resources would result in those who are fit for that environment being able to survive and reproduce, almost as if nature had selected them, hence natural selection, and there was born the theory of evolution through natural selection. He was particularly interested in how natural selection might have shaped rudimentary behaviors into kind of sophisticated instincts. And that's a question which modern scientists still are very much interested in today. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was a real development in the scientific and objective study of animal behavior. And that's thanks to a number of scientists, including Margaret Washburn, who actually was the first female to get a PhD in psychology. She wrote a highly influential textbook called The Animal Mind in 1908. And this was a textbook looking at various aspects of animal behavior over kind of a hundred or more species. And it became kind of the definitive textbook of comparative psychology for more than 25 years. The study of animal behavior went through a period where people believed that they were kind of machine-like reflexes, especially learning. Um, the word conditioning is used a lot where it's kind of an automatic form of learning. And this approach is called the behaviorist approach. The scientists who developed this approach were Ivan Pavlov, yes, the dog with the bell, although it was a buzzer, not a bell, that was a bad translation. John Watson, who terrified a baby with a rat, um, and B.F. Skinner, who put pigeons in boxes. Feel free to look up more of their work yourselves, but it all kind of surrounds learning and automatic learning or conditioning. The African-American scientist Charles H. Turner really challenged the idea that animals were just reflex machines. And he did this by extensively studying insects, particularly bees and ants. He found they made decisions based on past experiences and problem solving, revolutionary at the time. He was also among the first to use controls in animal behavior experiments. So very much moving away from the subjective kind of anecdotal views of animal behavior that we spoke about earlier and really kind of evolved it into objective science. This approach using laboratory experiments is now what we would call experimental psychology. A second movement, which became the discipline of animal behavior that we widely recognize today, left the lab behind and instead went out into the wild and observed animals in their natural habitats and ethology was created. 
So Carl von Fritz, Honeybee Dances, Conrad Lorenz, Courtship in Ducks, Nico Timbergen, who I'll link a video about his work above or below. Um, they shared a Nobel Prize in 1973 for their work in essentially creating ethology together. And the evolutionary oranges, why do I keep wanting to say oranges? Origins. The evolutionary origins of behaviour became the unifying question. The early ethologists really focused on the species level of behaviour. So, for example, courtship in the males and females of a particular species. Which is, I think, what's happening at the window at the moment with some birds. The next revolution in the study of animal behaviour really came with the recognition that selection acts on the genes of the individual. And this was notably advocated by George C. Williams, who wrote the book Adaptation and Natural Selection, but it was made popular by Richard Dawkins in his highly influential and successful book The Selfish Gene, which was published in 1976. Dawkins really showed how looking at natural selection through a gene's eye view could really explain how behaviours that benefit the individual at the expense of a species could still evolve. The selfish gene was so influential and it's a really good example of a popular science book really helping to kind of change a whole discipline and the idea of kind of for the good of the species really fell out of favour. When looking at behaviour from a gene's eye view, individual animals can be seen as survival machines where their genes need to replicate and pass as many copies as they can to the next generation. Animals can also pass on copies of their genes to the next generation through their relatives who share those genes if they help them survive and reproduce. This is the basis of inclusive fitness or kin selection, which is proposed in the groundbreaking papers of W.D. Hamilton. E.O. Wilson's monumental book, Sociobiology, which was published in 1975, was also highly influential in the study of animal behavior. It really demonstrated how there was such a kind of shift in focus of studying behaviour. In the 1960s, scientists really looked at the behaviour of groups in general terms. Using meerkats as an example, they looked at how, say, the subordinates of a group really behaved. Whereas this really developed into looking at behaviour on an individual level. For example, with meerkats, babysitting young siblings may be costly to the individual because of lost feeding time. But what is the benefit? There must be a benefit. And these kind of questions underlie behavioural ecology, which is essentially ethology and ecology. And I explain the difference between these two in a video I'll link up above and down below. The modern scientific study of animal behaviour really spans across a number of approaches, and these are growing all the time. Another area is neuroethology, which combines neuroscience, the study of the nervous system, and ethology. They try to understand how the nervous system translates biologically relevant stimulus into natural behaviour. So things like echolocation in bats, which is used for navigation and prey capture. Another example is the song production and learning and passerine birds. Um, a lot of work on how hormones act on behaviour. Really, really interesting stuff. So with the progress of technology, computational neuroethology or artificial ethology has developed. So that's using computer modelling to create the neural mechanisms underlying animal behaviour. Really, the sky is the limit. There are also areas where the knowledge of animal behaviour is contributing to very real issues in the world, such as conservation behaviour. And I'll link a video talking about that up there or down below. If you found this video interesting, useful or informative, please click on that like button as it'll help get it in front of people who might feel the same way as you. Also click on that notification bell so you get informed of when a new Behaviour Bites video comes out. And as always, thank you for spending the time with me today. Bye.